to In Edina, a program about the people, places, and activities all in the city of Edina. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald, and we bring you this broadcast from Edina's Public Works facility, which is going to be getting a new look very soon. Joining us to talk about it, City Engineer and Public Works Director, Wayne Houle, thank you very much for joining us, thank and you. also Architect Jeff Ortel from Ortel Architects. Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Really appreciate it, and how exciting for both of you to take on such a new project for an old building. We should talk about this site first, built in the early 60s, outgrown its use. That's, that's right. It, um, this facility was built in the early 1960s. It was built in a at that time an industrial area. Um, since that time, it's the, the the area besides us has turned over to a residential commercial area. And yeah, nice cool shops uh, in yep. this area now. Exactly. And so we so we we found our search started about seven, eight years ago down in the industrial area off of seventy seventh and one hundred and we found a uh, facility that, that meets our needs. It's um, all the it's old a, ConAgra yeah. building. We'll just tell yep. folks so that they have an idea where we're going to be moving the facility right. to. And and not only that, that it's in a, in, this is in a residential area. Is that it's a, it's basically a dinosaur in the public works arena as far as public works facilities go. We, How so? We're, we're uh, triple handling our equipment uh, to get at one piece of equipment. We might have to move two or three different pieces of equipment. It takes a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of time, especially if you have a water main break or something like that going on. Yeah, you don't if, want to be the, delaying that process it, by it, moving it, equipment it, around to get that, there. That's right. And the other one is the air quality within within the area, the, the mechanics area, which is behind us, um, is right within the vehicle storage area. So any of the trucks that run up and down the aisleway here are spewing diesel fumes into the mechanics area. Oh, that's not too uh, healthy to work in either. Right. Plus, okay. not all the equipment is here. It that's can't right. be. Yep. We we have equipment that's uh, um, underneath the uh, the Jerry's ramp uh, next to the Jerry's uh, supermarket, um, and then we also have the equipment down by Bramer. So we're we're creating a facility that we can pull all that equipment into, but yet we can kind of segregate it per department so that the departments can can utilize our equipment more efficiently. And it makes sense. I mean, if we're talking decades old uh, facility, any equipment has changed too. Right. Over, over the years, equipment has actually gotten larger. Um, for instance, our vac haul truck, which sucks out the, uh, the sanitary sewer manholes, um, that was non-existent back in the 1960s and 70s. So after several years of a site search and a decision on who to work with to build it, we turn to Jeff. What will the new place be like? Well, the new place um, will be very, very much improved from what you see today. The, the front of the building, which is the office area, will look essentially the same, cleaned up, but the entire rear of the building will have new insulated metal panels and precast concrete and it'll look spectacular on the outside and it'll look just as nice on the inside. And it's actually three times the size of this existing facility but one thing that perked my interest is it's a green facility so you really put a lot of time into how to make it efficient for the environment. The building will be quite sustainable. We have several systems in the building that will reduce energy uh, reduce cost and a few examples would be uh, first of all a geothermal system which um, essentially uses the earth to either preheat or pre-cool um, uh, the spaces in the building there'll be a lot better daylighting in the building to reduce cost reduce operational cost there'll be light sensors for the artificial lighting to either turn the lights on or turn the lights off and then there'll be uh, energy recovery units for the makeup air units in the uh, vehicle areas to again uh, preheat air uh, coming into the building in the winter time to reduce cost and, and energy. So it's reusing reusing existing power in the facilities uh, to, to create uh, heating and cooling exchanges, if you will. It's a lot of common sense uh, technology that we're using on the facility. I like the new age and I especially appreciate the green look 
and the green ideas to the building, but here's an even better deal. It pays for itself over time. The payback is big. How so? The payback uh, on all the systems being used in the building uh, would be no greater than 10 years. So whether it's the geothermal system or the daylighting, uh, we've calculated that the upfront cost, uh, the premium that the city would pay for the systems would be paid back within 10 years. That's a deal. And that makes sense. I mean, we've learned about how to make buildings not only a safer, but a, a cleaner environmentally as well, place to, to, to work, basically. And, and you were telling me that the natural lighting idea is not so bad for staff either. Yeah, actually, in all the projects that we've worked on over the years, we've noticed a higher level of positive attitude when people are working in buildings that have daylight or a view of the outdoors. It, it, again, it's common sense, but we've seen it happen. So it makes it a little bit more user-friendly for the worker, too, which right. affects about 60 or so employees here in the, in the city of Edina. Right. Um, it's going to start a few weeks from now, so a little bit later in the spring. And when will it be finished, Wayne? It'll be finished, uh, um, our move-in date is April of 2010. What we wanted to do was uh, not disrupt any of the services to the residents and the people of Edina. And so it's right between the snow season, ice rink season, and the uh, the ball maintenance, field maintenance season, and the street maintenance yeah, season. Yeah, so you gotta make sure that anything in the world of public works is not interrupted during, out, uh, during the rebuilding of a brand new place. That's right, yeah. All right. Well, no doubt we'll want to do this program from the new facility, so I look forward to seeing you then very much, and thank you so much for joining us on Inadina. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, coming up a little bit later in the broadcast, we'll find out how new technology is actually helping our water system, and that's good, whether we drink or work with water in the city. <laughs> It takes a lot of city vehicles to get around town and to get things done and to keep them running and on the road and working properly. We have foreman Greg Bretson. Thanks so much for joining us you on bet. Edina. How many city vehicles do we have? We're talking about police cars, fire trucks? Sure, all the different fleets, police, fire, public works, support vehicles, um, inspection vehicles, park department, um, about 325 pieces of rolling stock, which would be trailers and uh, cars, off-road equipment, that type of thing, anything that, a trailer and anything that goes down the road by itself. Um, if you add all the smaller pieces, uh, pumps and chainsaws and those types of things, yeah, the weed, weed whips whip. and <laughs> all that, you know, we're pushing 400 pieces of equipment to take wow. care of. All those things need to be maintained. And That's a lot of gear it to is. fix. It is. Uh, which, of course, everything breaks down. It how does. many uh, How many technicians do you have? The, myself and five technicians, and um, I was on the floor for many years and I'm, I'm a technician, I just don't do it that often anymore, but although I still like to do it and get out there when it's necessary, a snowstorm is a good example and everybody's on the floor handling everything to keep those trucks running to plow the streets. Keep everything working you smoothly. Bet. My car breaks down from time to time and when I'm without it, I can't go anywhere, which in this city, you can't get any work done. You can't and we, you know, we're, we're a supporter role, but and if we don't do our jobs, we always like to think the buck stops with us. They're not going to get their job done. So we really uh, strive to not have those things happen. We have strong preventative maintenance. So our yes, goal is always sure the, make sure the brakes work, make yep. sure it's so that when they out. need it, it stays working and, and, and runs great. So we don't have that downtime and we really work and we're doing we're, we're pretty good at that. Um, if we're doing things right, um, 25% are breakdowns that we deal with and 75% are preventative maintenance. So we always want to be doing the preventative maintenance. You're actually working on winter vehicles and, and, and equipment right now. Sure, shortly we will begin working on winter equipment. Uh, usually in July is about the time we start gearing up for winter and getting all the snow plows and the things that deal with snow removal ready. And it takes us from the 1st of July until about November to do those things. And so it's a seasonal schedule. It is a seasonal equipment. schedule, yep. And we try to be working on off-season equipment um, and, and getting that stuff ready. So some of our work on a daily basis is off-season equipment yeah. that we need to have ready for But that you also season. can't be too rigid about it either because as far if as you've got a fire truck all of a sudden that breaks down, you've sure. got to get on it. Absolutely. And then the planning in the morning when we assign jobs to the different guys, there are some jobs that need to be done. 
that day so that they're ready to be used the next day for whatever's going to go on. Mm -hmm. But I also have to have guys that are working on things that they can break away from. And sometimes you do site visit because it, it might be easier to keep something on the road to go check sure. it out, sure. like a fire truck, for instance. Yep. We don't want to take a, a, any piece of fire apparatus out of service that we don't have to. Yeah. Obviously, sometimes it's much easier to bring that piece here to work on. Mm -hmm. We're set up for it. But if I can avoid um, taking it out of service, I'll go to the station or I'll send one of our technicians that deals with that stuff on a daily basis, go see what we can do to keep that truck up for them. It's there, not we'll just do about can. fixing things too though, because you also do vehicle inspections. I mean, you work yep. to get through that. There's licensing involved in the vehicles. Absolutely, all that comes into play. We've got all sorts of different people and office support staff that take care of the licensing and all that. Yeah. Make sure everything's legal on the road. Exactly. And then new vehicles come to play. How often do you replace them? We have most of our equipment is replaced on a scheduled uh, uh, replacement. And um, depending on what it is and what it does, um, we'll set those schedules. Uh, dump trucks, the trucks that plow the streets and everything. Yeah. Those are normally a 10-year replacement, but we don't stay rigid on that because if we have a truck that's very good, and is doing well and everything, there's no need to replace that. Stretch we'll hang on to it a little longer and we may take a truck that's been very troublesome yeah. and, and cost us a lot of money and is going to continue to do that. We may pull that one out early and either put it into different service sure. or get it to auction because whatever is best for the city and the best bang for the buck, we may have to change that around. One last question, Greg, be a quick one too. Mm -hmm. With the change of technology, hybrids now, mm -hmm. where do you fall on that? Will the city be using something like that? Well, we're always looking at what's the most efficient what mileage and all that we always have and I know we're you know we're being scrutinized more and more lately you know yeah. and hybrids you know our big issue why aren't you using hybrids well the cost of a hybrid is quite cost right prohibitive now. and yeah. if we spend all that you know it's sometimes a third more yeah. for a hybrid the payback isn't yeah. there for the city we're still sp spending city dollars to get that vehicle whether it's and if we spend more up front and we right. still have to maintain that right. vehicle right. the payback isn't going to be there right. you know well, thanks for keeping an eye on it greg yeah, we do it we really appreciate it. thanks for keeping us on the road sure we look forward to having you back thank you Well, technology is helping us with our water system. And here to tell us about SCADA is David Gorgon, Utility Coordinator. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. We appreciate it. Technology seems to influence just about everything these days, but how in the world does it impact our water system? We have a SCADA system, which stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Essentially, there's remote radio monitors at all of our sites, our wells, our water towers, our wastewater lift stations and our stormwater lift stations. What they do is report information back to a server at Public Works, and then we have a, multiple computer screens that can control pumping and track trends and items like that. So I imagine this is a 24-7, 365 device. Absolutely. Fairly cost effective. Yes. When you bring technology into the picture. Mm -hmm. um, but how did we do it the old fashioned way? You used to have to send workers out to each of these sites to try and um, pumping totals, run times, actually manually turn these things on, check to see if something was wrong. Now you can now do that remotely from a computer. So, so this is about making sure we have enough water pressure mm -hmm. and a, enough water in the system, right. pumping for all of the access that is used in the entire city of Edina. Yes. We're talking about sprinkler systems. We're talking about my faucet in the kitchen sink, yep. washer and dryer. And commercial applications as well. Everything seems like pretty much everything uses water. I mean, from your car to you. So how much water do we have in the city of Edina? I mean, how much capacity are we using? We have four water towers. Two of them are half million capacity. Two of them are one million capacity. And then we have a reservoir with a four million gallon capacity, okay. as well as all the pipes obviously hold water at any one time. So uh, this might sound like a silly question, but uh, can we run out of water or does SCADA is what's really keeping us from running out of water? Or? SCADA is keeping up, is monitoring how much water we have as well as knowing how much we're drawing from the aquifers so we can track and see if we're getting to a danger area. Okay, and then what happens if we get to a danger area? Um, Regulate use, obviously. Yes, there's different steps, but yeah, you're trying to um, just conserve as much as possible and there would be steps involved if, if we got to a danger point. So uh, we regulate use in this city, obviously, uh, well, during the, the spring and summer watering seasons, for mm -hmm. instance. 
And so the SCADA data entry that you're getting from this machine is basically letting you know which tower is full or empty and when you need to move to another tower, for instance, maybe that's oversimplified. No, but. no, I think you're dead on. What the tower is, the, each of the wells that we have in the city are linked to the water towers and okay. they're level. So as the level in the water tower begins to drop, it calls for those wells to kick on and replenish the supply. Oh, wow. So uh, the future has got to be amazing for you too in water technology. It is. It's just, it's constantly trying to become more efficient, both with our usage, our energy usage, when pumps can run at their maximum efficiency, and then really educating about water conservation. Do all cities have a SCADA system, or do we just have one, or do they have some similar technology? Obviously, the cost efficiencies would maybe pay for themselves over time. Yeah, pretty much everybody uses a SCADA system now. The difference is how technically refined you want to be with it. Okay, so because we have a bigger population than some cities, is that why we have more refinement in our system or is it just by choice? Um, I think it's by choice. I find the city of Edina has an incredibly detailed and technically refined SCADA system. It's really one of those things where what, whatever you want to track and trend, you, you kind of can. And we really look at things carefully here. And that's a good thing for us and the, the consumer. And the consumers, for sure. Now, this will not, just to be clear, unless I'm wrong, this doesn't test the water. This basically just measures capacity. Yes. Okay, so we, we still have to manually go out there and water test for cleanliness and, and all of that. Correct? Yep, at our water treatment plants, we constantly monitor the chemical feed rates that are going in. Is the water safe? We send samples into state and other regulatory agencies. By manpower. By manpower, right. yeah. So there's always going to be this uh, relationship, if you will, between mm -hmm. the economies of efficiency of technology, which mm -hmm. makes our world uh, a nicer place to live in, uh, and the manpower balance that goes into just making sure everything is fine-tuned and, and healthy and, and, and well-regulated. Absolutely. Okay. David, very interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. I wish you luck as the utility coordinator. Keep that skate of thing going. Thank you. All right, keep that water coming in. We will. All right, thanks for joining us on In Dining. You're welcome. Well, I hope all of you have an opportunity to take a walk through any one of Edina's wonderful parks. They're well-maintained and led by Park Maintenance Superintendent Vince Cockrell. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, I'm happy to be here. I enjoy them. I know many others do, but it's a lot more than just mowing and planting flowers every year. Yes, it is. It's a pretty complicated system, and uh, uh, yeah, where we get the enjoyment of... Uh, the folks is when they get a chance to get out there and uh, enjoy the fruits of our labor. So, so how many different parks are we talking about in the city of Edina alone? We've got uh, 40 parks uh, and uh, several uh, wildlife habitat areas, uh, 1,500 total acres. Right, and you're talking about golf courses too? Yeah, golf courses are considered in our acreage. Uh, we've got uh, what's called enterprise facilities. Uh, we've got uh, the golf course, we've got uh, the art center, we've got Centennial Lakes, we've got Edinburgh, we've got the ice arena. And uh, those particular uh, sites are managed by on-site managers with uh, a minimum amount of staff uh, uh, and, like I say, some management. Uh, uh, as far as the equipment throughout the system, uh, the park uh, maintenance uh, department is the ones that provides all the equipment through this. So you essentially are, are managing staff. You're managing the planning of parks. Yes. So what goes in, what goes out, Capital and, improvements. And, and all the equipment, Yes. and of course the budget. Yeah, the budget, and that's a sticky one. We're a pretty lean machine, uh, and uh, with uh, everybody's aware of the times that we're going through right now, uh, to try to provide the service we do as well as uh, provide uh, a, a good product, that's where the challenge is. Uh, um, there's things that are out of control, uh, uh, the fuels, the electricity, the Yeah, when uh, gas, gas goes up, I imagine goes all up. the mowers, yeah. all the machinery that you have to, you to get Every, from here to there. Everything costs more to operate, and there's always a development of new equipment uh, for the yeah. system, and uh, uh, with new equipment comes higher prices, and those are the kind of things you've got to try to spitball at some of those uh, uh, guesstimates for future uh, equipment replacement, as well as uh, larger park improvements, uh, whether they be, uh, uh, you know, blacktop uh, uh, work and or complete uh, reconstruction of uh, uh, ball fields, tennis courts, uh, parking lots, uh, walkways, and things like that. And you hear about it from residents, but you really rely on your staff to give you the news about what's happening in the parks. I know you try to get to all the park system, but 
someone's got to wear the administrative hat, which means someone else is actually in the parks. Yeah, I do depend. I've got uh, 17 full-time and about 35 part-time, and uh, those folks are the eyes and ears of the system, and I really do depend on those guys and girls to uh, come forward and uh, let me know that uh, there's something going on in a different park because, uh, quite frankly, uh, with uh, the system as expansive as it is, uh, it's a, a tough job to try to get around and see all of those on a regular enough mm -hmm. basis to make sure you keep the maintenance up. Sounds like a really cool job and I know that you've got an opportunity to take like an hour to go test a park or test trees in the park too from time to time and your staff and yourself are monitoring things and one of the things in the news right now that I, that I should ask you about is this ash bore bug that yeah. is taking it out on ash trees. Yeah, it's uh, emerald ash borer, and it's uh, recently made its way into the uh, seven-county metro area uh, just east of Edina here. And uh, we've known it was coming for many years. It's been heading along the upper part of the United States, uh, coming from the northeast, heading this direction. So uh, the Department of Agriculture has been monitoring it very closely. And quite frankly, I've got a real experienced uh, forestry staff. And uh, we made that decision close to 20 years ago not to plant any ash trees within the Edina Park system. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, obviously we've got trees to deal with that uh, were in the system before that, but uh, we've done a lot of variety of uh, tree plantings that uh, won't be affected by this emerald ash borer. And it's, it's it hard to predict. There. I mean, yeah. you know, there's all kinds of bugs that come by import you or, or just, just happen along and, yeah. and become a problem. And that's why you have to test these things from time to time to stay on top of them. What about nuisance trees? I've got a couple of maples in my backyard creating all these whirly birds from time to time. Sure. I mean, how do you decide what tree goes in and, and, and out of parks? Well, we recommend to folks uh, that are either going to replant on their property or wish us to uh, do something on the boulevard. Like there. a memorial yeah. to yeah. in park systems or yes. on the boulevard sure. for residential we, areas. We take uh, donations and uh, at that point, I, I generally get them in touch with my forester and he's got a list of trees that uh, are doing well as far as uh, uh, with uh, diseases and uh, different uh, types of soils uh, that we have in Edina here. And uh, he'll give them that list and uh, they can decide on a tree mutually and uh, we'll take that donation and it goes from uh, me to the park director and from the park director to the city council and they approve the donation. And at that point we end up uh, working with the, uh, the resident to get that tree planted in the location that they'd like to see it. Oh, it's, it's, it's a partnership then between it, it residents is. It is. and businesses. And it's beneficial to the entire community. They get the beauty of the tree and uh, uh, we get the uh, beauty of uh, a, low, it a low price good. Tree, uh, and a low price uh, <laughs> uh, tree replacement for our park system. Vince Cockrell, you do a great job. Thanks so much for making the parks a beautiful place to recreate and just relax. You're, you're very welcome. If you drive around Edina, you know there's street projects happening, and even if you just live around town, there's plenty of exciting things happening to make everything look good and run smoothly. And here to join us to talk about it, Assistant City Engineer Jack Sullivan, thanks for joining us on Edina. Thank you. You've got lots of projects. Let's highlight, let's say, the top four. Sure. Um, our returning project from last year is Country Club Neighborhood. It's a two-year project. It's going to be wrapping up this fall. It's a very extensive neighborhood reconstruction of utilities, sewer, water, uh, sanitary streets, curb, lighting. lighting, that's a big one. That's yes. a big deal. Yep. Yeah. So uh, Country Club, and that's that's going along smoothly? Very well. The favorable weather conditions have really helped the contractor make some good progress and they did quite a bit of work over the winter as well. Mm, nice. So everything's on time at Country Club. Yep. Next? Uh, South Garden Estates, that's a neighbor that we're doing at South of 70 Street. Uh, street repair, uh, sewer, water, uh, pavement, curb and gutter. Very, very typical project for us. Now that's a common theme for some areas because you know these things have to be replaced and updated because systems change. So you have another curb and gutter uh, project going on as well, correct? Yeah, Mirror Lakes neighborhoods. Mirror Lakes is uh, north of Vernon Avenue. We're doing uh, curb and gutter, uh, storm sewer, some water main, and uh, some sanitary sewer work up there. Now uh, this is a one-year project too, right? One year. These will be wrapped up probably uh, mid-October at the latest. No surprises? No surprises so far. All right, good. Number four? Uh, the last one we have would be St. John's Park. That's down by 58th Street by Concord School. That's another neighborhood that's going to get curb and gutter, uh, pavement, and upgrades to utilities. So uh, those are some projects that are, are well underway, wrapping up pretty much on time. Everything goes well, of course. But you always have to look ahead, too. How do you look ahead? We have a five-year capital improvement plan that we do. Uh, we also have a 10-year anticipated schedule that we look out for over 10 years. 
but the real the heart of our, our program is a two-year. Uh, we're always looking a year ahead, uh, letting the residents know. We'll actually be notifying the residents for the 2010 and 11 projects hmm. in, uh, in August of this year so that they can get uh, prepared for upcoming uh, projects and what they might want to see in the neighborhood. All residents get notices on this? All the residents that live in these neighborhoods that we've defined, yes. So what are you looking at for the next year or two? We have some areas down by Braemar, uh, up by Parkwood Knolls. Uh, those are kind of the westerly and uh, southwestern part of town. Ideas about what you want to do to those areas? Uh, very particular? similar type of work. We uh, okay. tend to do the, the pavement rehabilitation. We ask about sidewalks and lighting. We ask about uh, any drainage issues, pedestrian issues, things like that. Mm -hmm. So they can help to tailor the project a little bit to what the residents' needs may be. Then there's general maintenance on top of all of this. That's true. This time of year, with the weather getting warmer, we can do projects like our seal coats. Uh, we can do a lot of paint striping, uh, crosswalks, the yellow lines and the white fog lines. So you see they'll be refreshing over the summer. And that's done every year, right? Every, basically every year, and especially okay. now that we're getting the summer. Before school starts in the fall, we'll certainly hit all the school areas a little bit harder as well. And then, then the blacktop areas where you take that off and put that back on again, what's that called? Uh, we do a mill and overlay. We okay. do a number of these projects every year where they just take okay. about two inches of the pavement off and then put it back down. It's a much quicker process than a total reconstruction uh, and gets about seven to ten years of life back into that road. Do you rotate these projects by the year? I mean, by the, by the use or, or how do you pick projects? How do you prioritize them? We pick projects based on a, a rating system where we actually uh, have a company that rates our entire streets and they use a scale from a 100 being a brand new road to zero being like a gravel road and somewhere in the middle there falls all the streets in town and so we tend to group them to neighborhoods and then use uh, the the average of these to figure out which street should uh, neighborhood should go first great so what about new construction any anything new we can look forward to a brand new road a brand new bridge or anything like that we're doing a few projects uh, york avenue uh, south of uh, 72nd down by the promenade they're getting two new pedestrian bridges down there, they'll be um, spanning for the promenade project as phase two of that project moves forward. So you'll be seeing that all summer long as well over by Fire Station 2 in the Y. Wow. Okay, Jack, thanks a lot for keeping us on the go and smoothly on the road. We appreciate it. And looking good, too. I love the lighting system. Right. Thanks for joining us on In and We'll have you back again, no doubt. Thank you. We'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us on In Edina and for the opportunity to bring you this broadcast right from Edina's Public Works facility. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald. Thank you for watching. Until next time, make it a great day. Mm -hmm.